So I'm back to this, doing some kinematics. Maybe you guys have already tried doing this yourself. Here's my diagram, right? I'm all about setting up and looking at my subscripts now. My subscripts say G with respect to O. That locks in the radial, director, uh, di uh, radial vector that I have to draw. It's from O directed towards G. Right? So that's G with respect to O. And that forces my AGO tangent to be this way. And it forces my AGO normal to go up that way. Right? So those are my normal and tangential components. And we know their magnitudes. They have to be related to my omegas and my alphas. Let's see if we can get all this down mathematically. So here we go. Here's my AG. And follow along here. AO, what do we know about it? Has to go horizontal. And under the condition of rolling without slip, it's alpha times r positive i. Right? That's true for any real rolling without slip. Alpha times r, and my i is in the positive x direction. I'm going to take my tangent, and I'm going to split it up into my i and j components. And it should look like the following. It should look like, so negative alpha r g o, the magnitude. So I can write that a little bigger here. Alpha r g o, and that's going to be, this is 60. So that's cosine 60 i. And it's downward, so that's minus alpha r g o sine 60 j. OK? So back to the right and downward. Then I'm going to take my omega squared r's. And my omega squared r is going to be negative up that way. So negative omega squared r g o times cosine 30 i. And then upward, plus omega squared r g o sine of 30 j. Okay. And that right there was probably the most challenging bit of the problem. If you got that, then everything is, is great. So I'm going to now break it up, and I'm going to say I want my AGX. AGX is going to be all of this, everything that I'm boxing here in the i components. These are my AGXs, right? These are my AGXs. So AGX has to be alpha r minus alpha r g o co 60 minus omega squared r g o cosine 30. Good. And everything is given to you except for alpha. So by my calculations, I actually can simplify it by plugging everything in. And it gives me this as like an equation in terms of alpha. That's really handy, right? So everything is done for you. Now I'm going to do my AGY. And AGY is all of the ones here. So this term and this term down here. So negative alpha r g o sine 60 plus omega squared r g o sine 30. And that gives you that. OK, so here, here's, where, here's where you just do all the substitutions. Remember my fx and fy equation? They had the agx, agy buried in there. And now I have it in terms of alpha. I can plug them into my n's and ff's based on those two uh, fx and fy equations. So I'm going to do that final step, and then we'll solve for alpha.
And I'm going to make you guys try this at home to get the numbers right. But you're going to basically substitute And let me call this now 1 and 2. So substitute 1 and 2 into the fx, fy equations. And then into sum of moments g. And you should get the following. Uh, solve for alpha, and you get alpha 13.88 radians per second squared. OK? So you plug it in, you get alpha, and then on top of that, if you plug it in further into the FF and, and normal force, you should get the following. FF is 20.12 newtons. And then the normal force is 91.3 newtons. OK? This is the solution to the problem. You still have to go back and check that one condition, whether or not friction is static or not. So let me do the following. You solve everything, and then so from n, we have an FF static max that is equal to mu s times n. All right. So this would be 0.5 times the 91.3. So the maximum static friction force is that. And the actual static friction force is 20, which is less than that. So what you write is FF static actual is equal to 20.12 newtons, is less than FF static max. Therefore, rolls without slip. Right? So your static friction condition was satisfied, therefore rolling without slip. Okay? Does that, does that make sense? So I brought, I brought in a lot of different elements here, right? The elements that were even before the rigid body section, we talked a lot about this friction uh, condition, about rolling without slip or with slip, whether surfaces are rubbing against each other. And we use this inequality frequently. I'm just bringing it back for problems related to rigid bodies. And I introduced it in sort of a brand new shape, this half disk. Um, in an exam setting, I, I imagine we'll give you guys, you guys should definitely write this in your equation sheet, right? The 4r over 3 pi. More, more often than not, all the other final exams that we've given, we've, we've just given you that distance. Um, and then you can work your, work your way through that. And then everything else is, is that, that kinematic part, right? That po the point O that travels in a straight line, I think that was another key key idea there that we were hoping that you would observe. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this one, uh, you know, when you're trying to find renders of uh, this equation with or without slip, uh, when you have FF and N, so you, can, you can't stop doing uh, FF equal to N with or without slip. Right? You can't sort of try to figure out if, if that's that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So the, the, the question was, can we, at the point where you did this, so let me just clarify it. That's a good point. I want to talk about what happens when there is slip, right? So let's just say this was, you know, what happens if you calculated this and the real friction was actually greater than this max, then rolling without slip failed, so it has to have slipped, right? So what happens now when you do slip? Well, if you do slip, if you actually slip, or if the wheel actually slips, If the disk actually slips, 
Uh, then you get the following, right? Sum of f is equal to magx is equal to ff. Sum fy, magy, n minus mg. OK. So the question was, why, why, like, why didn't we substitute mu sfn in here? You can't. Because mu sfn is an inequality. You don't know how much of a friction force is there to hold it to be static. Right? So you leave it as ff in order to determine actual friction force. In the event that the wheel actually slips, all of a sudden, kinetic friction. When it's kinetic friction, what do you do? You substitute this with mu kn. Right? And it has to be mu kn. The mu kn is this n here. Right? And you substitute it in. The mu kn determines for you what the acceleration actually is. And then the one condition that fails, AO is not alpha r. Right? This can't be true because you're rolling with slip, right? So this one fixed for you how much force was actually being applied at the bottom surface. But it therefore broke one of the other rules for rolling without slip. It couldn't have been alpha r. It is still i. It's still traveling in a horizontal line. But it was no longer alpha r. Does that make sense? Yeah, but how do you use that rule? Like, what would you call for AOE alpha or I? But if, in the end, we found out that it was compatible with this slip, wouldn't our whole math have been No. No, yeah, that's the beauty of it, right? So if, I, if you plugged in mu, mu kn, so this is n and n, just one unknown. FF is no longer an unknown, right? So guess what happens? You solve this set of equations. You have an AGX and AGY here that is basically like uh, um, it, it reveals for you the alpha that is an unknown, and the alpha does not satisfy alpha r, right? So your your set of equations is still is still going to work out completely nicely. It's just a change in what is unknown versus what is known. Okay. All right. So let me move on now. That's the last problem for this particular chapter. Let me now go to rigid bodies for work in energy. All right. OK, so, so listen, everything that we did for particles, imagine we just apply that to the idea that a rigid body is particles glued together. So everything that you've learned is actually very much applicable with just a few of these concepts and ideas expanded. Okay? And I want to show you just two expansions of our principles that happens when we're dealing with rigid bodies. And the way I'm going to start this is I'm going to draw you our very famous peanut shape, this irregularly shaped body. And I'm going to tell you that G is over here somewhere. Right? And over here is our typical little, little mass. It's our MI. Okay? And this object is going to rotate omega alpha. OK, so here are, here are a few things to think about, right? If an object rotates, it's got velocity at all these different points. Right? So it's got a velocity that's moving off, say, in this direction. That's my vi. Okay? Now what we know about all of this kinematics with rigid bodies is when it rotates, there's got to be a special point, the IC, the instantaneous center. The instantaneous center is not at G, right? So I'm going to. Draw a perpendicular line here, and I'm going to tell you that IC may be somewhere down there. Okay? So all of a sudden, 
I've generated a radial vector, and this radial vector is our, what did I write here, ri with respect to ic. Okay? So now every single point in the rigid body has an ri with respect to ic. Okay? And so what do we know about the velocity? The velocity i with respect to this ic is clearly omega times ri with respect to ic. No problem there. That's the definition of IC. So what about the energy, the kinetic energy of this rigid body? So the kinetic energy of the rigid body has to be just the sum of all the kinetic energies of all the little bits of mass. So you would expect it to be like this. Ti is 1 half mi bi with respect, well, bi squared. Okay. Now, the absolute velocity of that particular mass mi is vi, but I could also write it as 1 half mi vi with respect to ic. That changed nothing. Okay? And then I'm going to substitute my omega r into the thing, into my equation. It would be as if I said, let's take omega r i ic, square the whole thing. Okay, so now I'm going to sum across all mi's, and so our total energy for the rigid body must be sum of all of my little bits of kinetic energy, sum i one half mi omega squared. R I I C squared. Okay? So I'm going to factor out my one half omega squared M I R I I C. Okay, does anyone recognize this? M times an R squared. That's our mass moment of inertia. But it's mass moment of inertia around a very specific point, the IC. So it's 1 half I IC omega squared. OK? So that's great. OK, that's the one little twist here. If you're going to calculate kinetic energy of a rigid body, the equation actually turns out to be this. It's 1 half mass moment of inertia around IC omega squared, assuming you know omega. Okay, but here's the thing. IC is only great sometimes, right? We all know that IC happens to be really, really useful for rolling wheels without slip. IC is at the bottom where it touches the ground. But otherwise, IC can sometimes be a pain, right? It's a pain because IC moves around. Every little instant in time, IC is a different location not associated with the rigid body. So IC is dependent on the motion, right? It changes all the time, and that's really annoying, right? Whereas G, G doesn't move. G is the same G on the same rigid body, so it is fixed to the rigid body at one specific location. So let's see what we can do to manipulate this equation so that we can actually use IG instead of IIC. So I'm going to remind you guys of the parallel axis theorem again. Oops. The parallel axis theorem says the following. If I want an I that's at some other location, I make it IG plus MD squared. So if the I that I want is an IC, then I better make sure that the D is the distance between G and IC. See if I can do this here. So let me say D is my R vector of G with respect to IC. Okay? So I'm basically 
going to factor out the IG part of it. So if you agree with that, then what I do is I'm going to take my IIC omega squared and I'm going to plug in exactly that equation, my parallel axis theorem, like that. And so this becomes a 1 half IG omega squared. And then a second term that's 1 half MD squared omega squared, like that. And I'll even replace this d, ig omega squared plus 1 half m. And I'm going to replace this d. The d was my distance from rg to, uh, to ic, omega rg ic squared. OK? What is this distance, the, the, the radial vector from r to ic, what does that mean? This is just that distance from here to here. So this is my d, right? And omega times that one location is just the velocity of the center of mass. It's this guy right here. It's vg, okay? Which means I can rewrite this as 1 half ig omega squared plus 1 half m. And this now becomes Vg squared. OK. OK, so quick recap. I derived my energy for a rotating rigid body in general plane motion to be this all the time. OK, which means if you have IC, great, right? But if you don't have IC, or IC is moving on you, general plane motion says total kinetic energy is the sum of these two terms. And look very carefully. This one is nothing more than the translation component of kinetic energy. So imagine you're just following the center of mass, 1 half mv squared, right? And then on top of that, you add this, which is the rotational component of the kinetic energy. Basically, it's how much is rotating around point G. So it really boils down to the following. All you have to remember is T is equal to 1 half, I'm going to write this again. So 1 half IG omega squared is the rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so that's about g plus 1 half mv squared vg squared, and that is translational kinetic energy. Okay? Okay, so here's what happens, right? If, for instance, we're going to go through all of those different cases again, right? Just to make sure that we're clear on this, let's say you have rigid body motion, and I told you, right? Chapter 16.2, translation only. Translation only means omega must be zero. You're back to as if the thing was just a particle, right? If it's rotation about a fixed axis, T. What's your fixed axis? Fixed axis is kind of like an IC just all the time. So it'd be like IO omega squared. Right? So imagine that, right? IC is just pinned. It's the same IC all the time. You're, you're welcome to just say IO omega squared. There's no VG, nothing, no problem there. And then the one that I've written here is your general. General plane motion in 2D 
if you happen to be following center of mass, just make sure that you include both of these terms, I, G, omega. Okay? Okay, so let's do a quick example. Let's say I have like the corner of a beam that's on the ceiling. Okay? And let's say the disk is just hanging in midair and I've got center of mass G right at the center. And the disk has radius R. And it swings down from rest. And the final position of the disk is the following. Okay, so picture that I've got a disc and it just swings like this, like that. Okay, and the path that I'm going to follow is if I follow point G, here's my point G. It's going to travel in a circular path, right like this. So I'm going to draw this in a dark, dark line here. This is my path, and my new G position is there. Okay, and so this distance that it swings. Think of this as swinging 90 degrees downward. Okay? Gravity is down, so disk swings down due to gravity. From rest. Find VG, the speed of the center of mass, as it reaches this point. So after G reaches 90 degrees. Okay, so solution, right? You can do your chapter 17 stuff as much as you like. Some of forces, some of, uh, some of forces in x and y, some of moments, right? But this problem is velocities and displacements, right? The disk moved a certain distance, some work is done, maybe due to gravity, right? So the idea is just like we did in particles, if it's distances and velocities, use principle of work and energy. Okay? And I'll put it here in parentheses because the problem involves velocities and displacements. Right? And we we've, we've we've been we've been talking about that it has to has to make sense that we use principle of work and energy. I'm going to say T initial, T1, plus bunch of work done from 1 to 2 is equal to T2. OK? So guess what? The object is rotating, and it's rotating around a fixed point. OK? And so our T1 is at rest, so this is 0. Our T2 is going to be really easy. This one is our 1 half. And what do we use if it's a fixed point? I O omega squared. Okay. And then what's the work done? So all of the forces that do work in this problem is just gravity. Okay. And how much gravity was done? Well, all of the work should be done from just the motion of the point G as it drops from one height to another. So our work done would be mg 
from the height 0 to negative r, like so. So there was definitely drop in its potential energy translated into the kinetic energy. And so we just have to figure out what IO is. So what's IO? Parallel axis theorem, IG plus MD squared. So here's my G, here's my O, somewhere that's on the edge of the disk. And the amount of the amount for D, the displacement by parallel axis theorem, must be R. So IO is equal to IG. IG is one half M R squared for a disk plus M times R squared. So IO for a disk at its edge. 3 halves mr squared. So we finally have the following. Mg, capital R, is the amount of your, Mg, your MGH, basically. 1 half, 3 halves mr squared, omega squared. Rearranging, all the m's cancel. You're left with square root of 4 thirds g over r. And then finally, the velocity at theta is 90 degrees. Right? So the speed there must be then your omega times r. So this would be square root of 4g, 3r times another r. There you go. OK? Question? Say that again. The reactions at the pin do what in this problem? Do they do work? So the question is, OK, so let's put some reaction forces on this pin. Fy, Fx. Anybody, why, does those, why do those two forces not do work? No distance traveled, right? Work only done by forces that have a displacement, right? So there's no displacement on those ones. OK? All right, that was a, that was a really, really quick example. Uh, just wanted to give you that formula there. The key is one thing that I've, I've told you about in expanding the idea of work and energy for rigid bodies, don't forget about rotational aspects, right? Include a 1 half i omega squared, um, depending on if it's fixed or general plane motion. OK? So you're going to see me do that a lot, and then I'll, I'll throw another twist into things on Wednesday. All right? See you then.